She, uh, he's, she, he said this question is from the ladies of Kamabir, and they want to know about the war prisoners, and mainly the ladies uh, who do, do, do come and do the, the category. You plug their ears in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> who uh, do come under the category of Malakat uh, Aymanikum, they want to know, uh, do they have the same right as the proper wedded wives or not? She, and? she referred to the Zawajat al-Rasul Maria al Qutiyya also. You see, during a war which is fought according to the Quranic description, that the full bloodshed is carried out, it's not just a skirmish, but a real war. Those prisoners of war, who are ladies, as well as men, they are uh, put under control of certain people. This is not something new which was created by the Quran. This was the common custom of the entire world. So, first of all, this should be, this uh, aspect should be highlighted. People think, particularly the non-believers, non-Muslims, as though Islam has uh, created for the first time the teaching that uh, you own the people who are war prisoners. The fact is that prior to Islam, all prisoners were treated in war prisoners were treated in such bad manner, such inhuman manner, that uh, to read about how they were treated, the men and women, one shudders. So what? Islamic teaching is about them, about uh, the prisoners of war, is extremely beneficent and speaks of their rights rather than people's rights over them. It modifies people's attitude to them. Now remember that like our modern times, they are not, the great war camps were not possible. Who would maintain them? Who would take care of the prisoners of war in huge war camps? In modern times, it has become possible, but still, there are very, there are many evil practices which are related to this. So I am forgetting that I am talking of people going to the time which Islam had inherited a time of war where prisoners had to be done, done with, something should have been done about them. So they were naturally distributed to different houses. Among them were adults, among them were orphans, among them were widows, among them were those who were not yet married. And as far as their marriage, previous marriage was concerned, those women who were married, that marriage was automatically cancelled. Because when you go into war and you are conquered, then previous relationships are annulled automatically. So that was the universal custom of the time. So keeping this in view, now we turn to this question. Islam speaks of the rights of prisoners of war in every area. It speaks of orphans, it speaks of widows, it speaks of uh, unmarried girls, etc. And it hands them over in the custody of people because there were no war camps. So at the same time, it reminds the people to be kind to them, to be extremely thoughtful of their requirements and of their 
uh, sensibilities. They should not be insulted, they should not be slapped, they should not be beaten up. So people who speak of just women and the they forget all the surrounding atmosphere of uh, such people and the slaves. So number one, slaves are made during wars, according to the Holy Quran. There is no other method which can be introduced to the world to turn people into slaves. The Quran does not suggest any single method other than the war which can produce slaves because everybody is born free so keep this in mind and now listen to the points which I'm going to raise here Islam on the other hand introduce, introduces so many uh, reformations in the society and so many possibilities of liberating slaves that after a while it is not possible to find a single slave in Islamic society because either they die or they are liberated and their children are not slaves Children of slaves are not slaves because this is not a method of creating slaves which is mentioned in the Quran. Only wars can create slaves and slaves do not give birth to slaves because every child is born a free child. This is a universal teaching of the Quran. Keeping that in view, now visualize that you cannot make slaves but you must liberate them to win the pleasure of Allah and there's so many ways and means of freeing slaves of freeing. when a phase if a slave slave is liberate him there's enough evidence from a hadith that somebody slapped his slave and Rasulullah saw and shouted to him, you are earning the wrath of Allah by doing so. He said, I liberate the slave. He said, yes, this is right. So liberation of slave was the rule and to keep them was exception only for the service of one's lifetime it was possible but at the same time liberation of slave was a routine in Islam with the results that at some times even 60,000 slaves were freed by some uh, wealthy Muslims just to seek the pleasure of Allah so where did they come from? <laughs> they either came from the non-Muslim society or they came from uh, as a product of war slaves. So Islam is beneficial not only to those slaves who are Muslim but is beneficial f uh, to those slaves who belong to non-Muslim society. This is a wider aspect of Islamic uh, uh, beneficence of Islamic teaching. Hakim bin Hazam is known to have liberated slaves, as I have said, 60,000 slaves at one moment. So this is Islamic teaching about slaves. Within a generation or two, it should be become hard to find a single slave in Islamic society. And that is what actually happened. 
But uh, that is what should what should actually have happened. But it did not happen uh, quickly because of other slaves infiltrating the Muslim society from all over the world. Because Arabs had got the habit of using slaves as their personal servants. So although they did not turn Muslims into slaves themselves, or because there were no war prisoners, they could not gain slaves to that source, but they had plenty of sources all around them because the world did not mind creating slaves. So, sold, they became the property of the Muslims who owned them. But with certain rights, with certain obligations, they could not treat them inhumanly, as I have said. According to the Holy Quran, your slaves, even if you buy them, must be treated so much alike that sometimes the clothes you wear are worn by the same by the slaves. It is preferable not to create any distinction. The food you eat must be shared by the slaves. So slavery in itself is a sort of an excellent form of ordinary uh, servants whose condition is improved. In the modern times when you have servants, you do not treat them alike. You do not give them the same food. You did not make them wear the same clothes. But these slaves, which were permitted to be have, to be bought, were raised in status so much so that they were, they lived like family members. So what objection can you have against these slaves? Because a new form of uh, creating ser opp opportunities to obtain services from other people like laborers, etc. So they worked as, uh, as servants, but they were treated as household people, belonging to the house, I mean, not household. So this is the overall picture which should be kept in view. After this, if you have to ask any question which relates to conjugal relationship, I would request you to drop it for the time being because as I said, you know, the ladies will have to put plugs into their ears. But on that subject, I have repeatedly spoken in other question-answer sessions. And also during my uh, That's the Quran, I have also spoken on this subject. So that should be sufficient. If you want to find out the answer to this, you can read that. One thing must be answered in relation to Hazrat Maria Kriptiya. This again is the Quranic tradition strictly followed by Ahazur Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that if a slave woman gives birth to your child she is automatically liberated and uh, becomes your wife. Whether nikah is performed or not, that's a separate issue. But a slave girl, when she gives birth to your child, I mean a Muslim child, she becomes liberated that instant and uh, uh, should be treated equal to other rights, other, other wives. Right? I know it's very long, but he will be able to manage it, inshallah.